in the darkest worlds that ever were. The only thing that brings light are stories. Those stories are kept in one place. The tiny bookcase. <laughs> Hello, explorers of the Sacred Library. I'm Ben. I'm Nico, and you're listening to The Tiny Bookcase. We are joined today by an author who The Guardian named as one of their fresh voices. 50 writers you should read right now. Fresh! How very 90s of me. <laughs> their work is philosophical, experimental, and laced with abandoned houses, rare insects, and old clocks. It's our pleasure to welcome the marvellous Nina Allen. Hello, Nina. Hi there, Nico. Hi there, Ben. It's wonderful to be here. Are you uh, struggling in the heat? Because obviously we're both in the UK and it's very hot down south. How's it, how's it up there in Scotland? It is bizarrely hot up here in Scotland and obviously we're not massively used to that. But that does not mean we are not welcoming it. It's a glorious day here on the Isle of Bute. Bute. Oh, that's nice. Um, and unfortunately, it is slightly too hot for me down here. I'm not. Uh, I don't have uh, Nico's Mediterranean genes. I don't think so. There is. Uh... I mean, I am still sweating horribly. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a perpetual state of sticky. Scotland's just that little bit cooler, so it's beautiful, exactly how you'd want it. <laughs> how have you been getting on in the pandemic? Once again. Um... I feel extremely fortunate um, because if you have to be locked down anywhere, I would say a Scottish island would be one of the better places to experience that. Yeah. And, you know, being a writer, um, I have been able to keep working. Uh, we've had some some pretty weird experiences. And obviously there's the general background ambient anxiety that everyone is going through and anxiety for friends and family who aren't in as fortunate a situation but we have been all round very lucky so as an anxious person it's been quite bad for me the last 18 months because it was like being proved right and i've spent so many years convincing myself it's just your anxiety there's nothing to worry about and then they said no there's something to worry about worry worry all of the time yeah, I, I really, really sympathise and I, I know that I spent at least the first three months of the lockdown feeling very, very angry, very, very on guard, even though nothing was particularly happening to me. As I say, we were in, in a fortunate situation. There was still this sense of complete disjuncture from the world as we had imagined it was. And yeah. This is still being processed and it's it's exceptionally sort of challenging to try and parse that as a writer. How do you respond? I mean, obviously, you don't just want to write a pandemic novel. There will be many, many, too many of those, but it's impossible not to respond somehow. So it's it's yeah, it, it is very much a full alert, I'd say. I think that's that's very wise this idea of like responding somehow this is so large this event and it's affected absolutely everyone on the planet seemingly that it it simply must affect the way human culture works and writing's a big part of that exactly um, so it's it's going to be i i agree that maybe not walking out and, do, and just writing a, a flat pandemic novel but in the same way that um obviously this is very different but in the same way that 9 11 changed american culture quite a lot and the way that that impacted the world like i suspect we'll be seeing the the waves of change across culture for for a long while after this, no matter what happens with the rest of the pandemic. And it's absolutely. I mean, I, I, it's directly comparable with nine eleven. Sort of in that nothing nothing can be the same after it, and no. it has. You know, it's it's extraordinary, and it's one of those things that you just simply cannot predict. And so you're you're kind of it throws you into a very odd kind of living in the present tense because you can't plan ahead, and yeah. that's. That's odd in and of itself. It's a very strange time, but it um, it has been absolutely fantastic uh, being able to talk to so many um, excellent authors and yourself included here. So I think I need a bit of a story refill. So we're going to go straight into some stories. 
the prompt this week is empty tank and uh, Nico is going to be going first. Empty tank. Daddy has tried to explain our house to me many times. It is a small place, just one room. Its windows are slim and our door is a hole that points towards the sky. I've never used the door. Daddy says it's not allowed. He says that everything outside is dangerous and it's only for grown-ups. I'm seven now, so I think I am old enough, but Daddy says no. I hear him, sometimes when he thinks I've gone to bed, on the nights when my tummy hurts because it has nothing to do. He cries and asks for help from God. I don't know who God is. Daddy doesn't talk about him when I'm awake. Sometimes he cries for my Evelyn as well. I don't know if it's his Evelyn or if it's just one word. Words are difficult, I think. Daddy says it would be easier if we had more books. We only have a couple of books. But Daddy remembers other ones for me. He's told me lots of really good stories. I like the story of Forrest Gump. He's a wise old man. He tells me about how Forrest Gump ran forever and ever and he never got tired. I'm jealous. I am too big to run in our house now. Soon my back will be all bent like Daddy's. He says the weight of the world is on his shoulders and then he laughs. But it's... It's not a nice laugh. He makes me laugh and it feels nice and warm, but his laugh is different. It scares me a little bit. I remember, but not very well, when things were a bit easier. The food then was softer. I really miss the taste of fruit. It's been years since I've had a piece of fruit. Pears were my favourite, even when they were all mushy and Daddy said they weren't any good. They were so sweet that it made my teeth ache. But Daddy stopped bringing fruit home. I've offered to go with him so many times. I think I'd be good at finding fruit because I like it so much. Daddy tells me I'm not allowed to climb through the door. He tells me that what waits outside is not safe for little girls. But I tell him I'm a big girl. And he looks at me so strangely. His eyes look like they're crying. But he doesn't have tears. It's all very confusing. I asked what was outside every time he came back and he always said the same. Danger. I only got a different truth once. He came back clinking and clanking and his bags were all full of brown bottles. I asked what they were and he smiled and said, A treat for Daddy. I tried some of Daddy's treat and it was horrible. It's no wonder he wasn't bringing back any fruit if that was what he thinks is a treat. Daddy drank it all though, and he smiled a big smile and we danced all crunched up in our home. Daddy told me about many things from the outside then. He kept saying, back when things were normal. And then he would tell me of amazing things. He explained a fun fair to me. I have to confess, I can't really imagine such a thing. So many of the concepts are really confusing. While he was like this, all open and happy and free, I asked what was outside now. Were there still fun fairs? He cried then, properly. Ghouls, he said. I don't know what that means. But he said it a few times. When I asked again, he became frightening. His big hands squeezed my shoulders and they hurt me terribly. There's nothing out there but darkness and pain. And those fucking ghouls. Those what ate the living when everything else was gone. Don't you get it, girl? It's you and me and it's running out. All of it's running out. And I have to watch my baby grow up broken in a fucking panzer.
I don't know what most of that means. I'm scared to ask. I don't like feeling daddy's hands on my shoulders like that. His skin is very rough and he's very strong. So I don't ask what's outside anymore. He goes every now and then. And he tells me it's once a month. But I don't really understand what that means either. He's sometimes gone for one sleep, sometimes two. The longest last time was six sleeps. I became very tired then, and I was so glad to hear the door open and close and Daddy come home to feed me. But his journeys for food are longer every time now. More often three sleeps than one. I don't mind. I tell myself his stories while he's gone. But I'm running out of stories at the moment. He's been gone a long time. I stopped counting the sleeps after a while. I wanted to climb to the door and, and look out just a bit. Maybe he needed help carrying the food in. He wouldn't mind if I helped him, would he? But I... I couldn't get up when I wanted to. I think my legs have forgotten how to walk. Just like they've forgotten how it felt to run in our house. So I'll wait here for Daddy to come back. Back safe from his ghouls. Whatever they may be. Oh, well that was horrifying. <laughs> I can see you really enjoyed writing that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's just like the perfect little horror story. Told from the point of view of the of the child as well is 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 uh, horrendous with that unsettling voice that you were doing. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you opened with the word daddy, I knew we were in for a real time. Yeah. I mean, it could have it, gone two ways. Couldn't it? Yeah, yeah, well, either way. It's, uh, yeah, it really reminds me of the novel by Emma Donoghue, Room, that was, you know, based on the Fritzl case in Austria. With That was from the young boy's point of view, where he and his mother were kept in confinement in the, you know, in, in room. And yeah. it, it's, it's really, um, obviously, this, ha this has an added horror element, but um, fantastic. I, uh, I I I liked it a lot. Um, I think the way that you do your voices, and then uh, the, then the way that you've written the characters suits the way that you then that you do the voices works beautifully well. Like it's it's always such a great performance, and like the the bit where uh, the little um, child is talking about like bent backs and different truths, and that uh, their, their uh, tummy has nothing to do. Um, it all like worked so well to create what was happening, and it it's obviously brutally sad. This child like starving to death and limbs not working, and never having seen the outside of a tank. Oh, totally. And the, and and the, you know, really importantly, the way information is revealed, such that the little girl doesn't understand what she's hearing from her dad but we get we get that perspective we know so that's you know really cleverly handled mm. very kind of you mm. it's uh it was a quite a fun challenge to set for myself to have a very limited vocabulary when writing that character i was going to ask you about that because obviously it is a child but also it's an yeah. extremely the most sheltered child you could possibly have um a handful of books and whatever her father happens to say and, will, and is willing to explain what it means is is your um vocabulary limit it's uh it's intense and so the first pass i wrote and then i read it back and i thought there's just no way <laughs> that, that you know looking at sentence structure and saying well if i if i if i have it like this yes it's correct grammatically but I don't think that's important to this story. I think it needed a little bit of mess in how the, the words were put together. 
Well, I always think about that kind of thing. It's just being sort of, it, it's the you know the Pirates of the Caribbean thing. You know, the less rules, more guidelines. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and if you, if you're doing it for effect and you're still communicating and people understand what you're doing, then it doesn't really matter if you write something that's not um, grammatically perfect. I I think, but I know a lot of people think the complete opposite, and that if you if you don't do the grammar right, then it's not a story. <laughs> I just worry about uh, the ghosts of English teachers coming out of cupboards. Yeah, no, I could, I could. no, no. I mean, like the whole thing feels so organic and natural. Mm. It's you know, it it has that quality that good stories have, which is the feeling that it couldn't have been written any other way. It just feels very natural, and um, the the as you say, the limited vocabulary and the style of diction is very much a part of that. It gives it a lot of feeling. I agree. I agree. But you're both being far too nice to me about my work. I'm going to insist that Nina takes over and tells her story. <laughs> well, part of what's so much fun about this is the it, it's proof of something I've always maintained. that If, um, you know, you give a room full of writers one prompt, you are going to get such completely different stories and i absolutely love that about this project of yours you know the way that we can explore the different responses to a prompt and uh, it's especially great when we've had no contact with one another in between being given the prompt and now so we've had no idea what the others are coming up with so i i absolutely love that oh that's, so, that's wonderful to hear yeah um shall i go with mine now please do when you're ready okay Empty tank. The target was immaterial. So long as the organisms were released within the 10 day period and under conditions that would be conducive to their survival, Church would get his payout. The nymphs can stay alive pretty much anywhere, Baggett had said, but in order for them to multiply, they need access to water. They lack a moist, humid atmosphere. A bathroom is ideal. The Kreef were a semi-aquatic life form, she explained. Even a small number of individuals would spread rapidly through the underground sewage system. The entire northern quarter of the city will be seeded in less than a year, Baggett said. If you do your job properly, that is, which I know you will. She had barely glanced at him as she said this her eyes directed instead towards her screen as she tapped and scrolled, tapped and scrolled. Where are you from? Church had asked her at their second meeting, the crucial one, the one where terms had been agreed. She shown him the proof he had asked for. The encrypted file had arrived in his inbox shortly after midnight the day before. Transcripts of calls he had made, names he had leaked, not just enough to ruin him, enough to put him on trial for treason. Since treason had once again become a capital crime, a change in the law that he, Church, had argued for, had voted for, had, according to some, made the central platform of his return to politics, there would be those who, if they knew of his situation, might laugh behind their hands, murmur how he was rightly hoist by his own petard. Sven Kamerud, for example, would have a field day, though with a hack like Kamerud, it was more a question of professional one-upmanship than personal animosity. Louise, though, Louise was a different matter. The way she had betrayed him still made Church feel ill, even a year on. Not just the fact of it, but the shock, the moment of realisation, the long, tawdry aftermath. His climb back had been painful. There had been many moments when Church had asked himself if it was worth it, whether any of it was worth it. Burn out. He could almost hear her whisper it. Church wondered if it had been Louise who had passed the information to Jocelyn Baggett, if she was responsible for this new nightmare as well as the old one. Baggett had refused to name her source, but... You do understand, Baggett was saying. Oh, of course, Church said, coming back to himself with a bump. 
He had no idea what he had just agreed to, what he was meant to understand or not. Jocelyn Baggett was not the kind of woman you could safely ask to repeat a question. Church found himself wondering again if she was infected herself, if she was no longer human. Those eyes of hers, the queasy blackness of them, the near invisible boundary between iris and pupil. She was beautiful, he supposed, in a way. If you could somehow separate that from what she was, from what she was planning, which, of course, you could not. Church coughed. When do I, uh, how should I, uh, take delivery? Baggett smiled, her lips compressed together in a hard line. Oh, you can leave that to us. That evening, Church got drunk, and as he poured himself his fourth, or was it fifth, glass of Rioja, he asked himself if he even believed, if the whole thing wasn't bullshit, and if so, what was he mixed up in really? What was their game? The Kreef, Baggett had told him, were an alien entity. No, no, not alien, he corrected himself, an alternate world entity that had once been present in our world, that were its rightful rulers. What we're doing, Baggett had said, is restoring the natural order of things. No more, no less. You remember those campaigns that were popular a couple of decades ago to reintroduce lynx and wolves to the Scottish Highlands? They failed, Church mumbled. Oh, well, yes, well, the wolves clearly didn't have the right kind of help. Help like you, she said, and there was something in the way she looked at him an absence of compassion so total and so conscious that struck Church as beyond evil. The cold equations, he thought, the currency of hell. Because hell, if it existed, would be like this. No cackling, no gloating, no stupid jokes about the exorcist. Just an overwhelming knowledge of the end. A bottomless blackness, like everything's shut down forever and no fucks given. Church shook himself. The bottle was empty. No wonder he was tail spinning. He went to bed, making a point of cleaning his teeth and setting the alarm. When shortly after breakfast the following morning the tank was delivered, he felt strong enough and angry enough to convince himself the whole thing, the whole charade, was a joke at his expense. Or if not a joke exactly, those files were real after all, then an attempt to push him out, to make him go quietly, a mundane political threat. Something Louise had dreamed up most likely. If he took the trouble to look into Jocelyn Baggett's background, and he would, he promised himself, he would, he would no doubt discover she had been working for Louise Michener all along. Church cursed himself inwardly for not realising it sooner. Someone was taking the piss. Time to get real. The tank was lined with gravel, and on top of the gravel, some greenish-brown fuzzy growth that looked like moss. Amongst the moss were some medium-sized pebbles. At first glance, the tank seemed empty of life, though as Church stared at the moss and the pebbles, he began to see it was not. Five, ten, a dozen things skittered and flurried and floated about the mossy hollows and micro-boulders of their artificial universe. If Church had been forced to describe them, he would have said they were like transparent woodlice. Transparent woodlice only five times the size of an ordinary woodlouse with long articulated legs and thread-like antennae. They could run like buggery, he saw as he watched them, fascinated in spite of himself. They could squeeze themselves flat as a coin, slide under one of those pebbles like a piece of junk mail under a doormat. Freaky. The idea of touching them was horrifying, though bugs and spiders didn't normally bother him. He would have to, though. He couldn't very well transport them into someone's bathroom in the goddamn fish tank. Jocelyn Baggett, typically had brushed this practicality aside as of no account. Oh, it's quite easy, she said. The night before release, you place the tank in a cold place, a chest freezer or an unheated outbuilding. Low temperatures make them inactive. You can transfer them from the tank to a smaller container by hand. It's quite safe, she added, for you and for them. Safe and simple. Safe and simple, my ass. 
That evening, Church got drunk again. He rehearsed his plan in his head, learning its details by heart so they seemed preordained. He was going to call Louise. This had been his intention from the start. He realised that now, from the moment Jocelyn Baggett had sent him the file, and ask her for a reconciliation. He would tell her things, things he hadn't said to her in years. He might even cry a little. Louise would take the bait then, for sure. She would invite him round to talk things through. They had always been good together, in bed that was. In his own subtle way, Church would remind her of that. He imagined her bathroom, the sunken tub with its lapis tiles, the lavender-scented towels, the sauna. Moist, Baggett had said, moist and humid, with access to water. The slow, inexorable takeover of one organism by another, Baggett had also said. Have you heard of the ignimon wasp? The cordyceps fungus? Once a person is infected, in every way that matters, they are already creef. Where one door closes, another opens. Do you see? Louise had treated him like an insect. Fair exchange was no robbery, Church thought. Just deserts. It had to be soon, though. The ten days Baggett had given him were ebbing away. Tonight, he decided, the creef would go into the freezer tonight. Then he would call Louise. The tank seemed much as usual, and as he reached up to lift it from the top of the filing cabinet in his office, Church barely glanced inside. Glancing inside made him nervous, though it was Baggett and her ultimatum that really made him nervous, he told himself. The moss, the pebbles, the darting transparent wood lice. He had seen those so many times now, they were becoming boring. He carried the tank carefully downstairs, placing it briefly on the floor as he unlocked and opened the door that led into the garage. It was only once he was actually in there that he noticed. The tank's lid had become dislodged, and the tank was empty. Not apparently empty, the way Church was used to, but empty. Had he unseated the lid himself, carrying it, or had it been like that for a while and he hadn't noticed? Church found he couldn't say. The blood beat in his ears. It occurred to him that he might justifiably call Baggett, claim his payout, although money now seemed the least of his concerns. Oh. <laughs> what a fun story. Oh, I, lo I loved it. <laughs> The uh, the descriptions of the the transparent wood lights were horrible. <laughs> There's so like like really really um, full and rich descriptions of something really quite disgusting. <laughs> Thank I, you. I quite like bugs, and even I was <laughs> I was a little bit freaked. <laughs> it was the description of how small they could get, like, hide under a coin. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was, that was a really good bit of description actually. This like. Um, can throw themselves flat like a junk mail under a doormat. Yeah, that was really good. Um, and uh, oh yeah, and this um, really well painted this um, this picture of this uh, this church main character. What a dreadful uh, bastard he was! Yeah, really. <laughs> I, I hate to say this, but he was kind of inspired by Dominic Cummings. <laughs> ah yeah, no, I was definitely getting a Dominic Cummings sort of lizard <laughs> vibe from him. Um, I'm yeah, sorry, I may yeah. have not gone hard enough on bastard there. Yeah. <laughs> also, though, like quite, I thought you actually knelt. Like, I think we probably all had those evenings where you've had a little bit too much to drink about something that you're annoyed about, and you're thinking about it, and you're spinning out. And I was just thinking right before you said it, this is a really good description of someone spinning out. Um, and then you said that he ha he himself had like a moment of realization that he was tail spinning. Yeah. Well, I thought that was very well observed myself. <laughs> yeah. But it's yeah, I I you know, it's he's he's caught and you know, what else is he going to do? <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully um any kind of treason uh, Dominic Cummings I mean church uh, has done, will, will be will be punishable but with uh, <laughs> absolute Um that was a lovely story and fascinating as well like how you got so many things into it like this this idea of this like alternate world life forms 
was really cool. I thought that, you know, the distinction between that and an alien was very interesting. I'm, yeah. I'm gonna ha- I'm gonna have to come clean about this because it, it, the story's kind of it's like an offshoot in a way from my novel The Rift, and anyone who's read that will have immediately seen that. Right? I don't think it matters because the story stands That's really cool, quite. Yeah nicely but i like it's something i really enjoy doing which is sewing together bits of a universe and there there's another story um a novella called maggots that um was was published by solaris a couple of years ago a standalone novella that also has shades of this and you you could imagine jocelyn baggett the um the character in this story to be one of the band of disreputables from maggots um and you know who are also kind of doing getting up to no good um with these these kind of transferable entities and i just really it, it, i just like these sort of like almost alternate windows on the same universe and it, it's a game i really enjoy playing and with the with the proviso and caveat that the story has to stand by itself of course you well, say I... it doesn't matter but what what it does mean ben is that once again i have not survived an episode without putting or something me. on my wish list on amazon <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, I, I really like. I also really like the the sort of neatness of that. Um, but I think neatness is almost the wrong word. Like it's like depth, isn't it? Um, that that's optional. Um, it, it, exactly. I mean, the the writer David Mitchell talks about this a lot, and it's sort of like I I absolutely haven't sort of aped him in this. It's just something I feel really equally drawn to, and he talks about his own you know the 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 freedom to go back and revisit characters or situations is something that really interests him and mm-hmm. readers can obviously pick up any one of his books they don't need to have read a single other word he's written they can just enjoy that story but equally readers who enjoy his fiction and like following him and and read his books you know as they come out are always going to get that little extra frisson and I, in my own, uh, in in my own modest way, I I like to think, you know, the same that that readers might get a kick out of readers of the rift, might get a kick out of this, or readers that now listen to this story today might go and explore the rift and think, oh my god, <laughs> they're, they're out yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I like it. I think I think it's a really I think it's a really exciting thing to be doing with your with your work. And also, it's it's it sounds like it's just a really fun thing for you to do as well, because um, you've got I, a lot. I of really doing. enjoy it. I really enjoy the idea that characters and situations don't die. And I've always had this thing that I what I like in fiction is stories and novels that feel as though your encounter with them on the page is just one episode, one chapter in that, and that the life. And people go on beyond the final page, and I I really enjoy that. I really enjoy reading it. I really enjoy creating it. I think it speaks volumes as well about the quality of the story and the character and the setting when it can be picked up and and seen from another angle or seen in a different time or place, and it still holds water. I think it means yeah, you're I, definitely onto something good. I I hope so, and. It's it, the thing I found really amusing about this is when you sent me the three prompts mm. and I saw that one, it was just like immediate. It was just like, oh, my God, I can you, you know, and that's that was what Tank meant to me. And it was only later after I'd finished writing the story that I thought, oh, my God, you know, there are so many different interpretations. It could have been empty tank as in oxygen tank on a spaceship. Mm. It could have been you know empty tank as in you've run out of petrol on a on a on an isolated highway late at night you know texas chainsaw kind of thing but those things didn't come to me until after i'd finished this it was just an instantaneous identification of that you know yeah it's a tank and some creep have got out of it <laughs> which yeah. must mean i'm really weird but there you go <laughs> yeah, no that's that's the that's the good stuff that's that's the really good stuff it is Maybe. strange how a prompt sometimes just jumps out at you um and I, I even said this to Nico the other day. The um, the prompt empty tank is is a gorgeous one. Like it's really open, but it's got enough 
meat on the bones that you can go in so many different directions um it just sounds sinister from the off whatever it just has yeah. that vibe which sure. you know made it very attractive to me there, there yeah. are some that we've had in the past where we've we've actually they've sounded good but when you've when you come to think about it you're like oh this is a bit tight there's not yeah. a huge amount of room to move here um yeah. and uh, yes but it they, it always works out well in the end well hopefully anyway Oh yeah, um, pressure's really on you now, sunshine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Go for it. <laughs> rather unfortunately, I'm fairly sure the way that I've explored this, this is, has already been slightly touched upon. Um, but we'll see. We'll see how we go. It's it's a different place, a different time. So here we go. Empty tank. We called them the Tiger Trappers, and we loved them. Their stolen Panzer had turned more than two dozen skirmishes in our favour. And those were just the ones I'd heard about. Some of the lads claimed that the TTs used acid to scorch the swastikas from the thick hull metal. Others said they'd kept the foul insignia in order to stay behind enemy lines as we pushed across Europe. Stories about the tiger trappers jumped from battalion to battalion, told and retold like a new joke. Their existence inspired hope in the face of our tactical disadvantage. I'd never seen them in action, but I'd heard about how the intrepid tank crew had stolen a Mark II Tiger during D-Day, and had been using it to bully and bushwhack the Nazis ever since. No one seemed to know who they were, but they were said to appear out of the gun fog when needed. Some of the other crews began to revere the TTs as a guardian angel. I privately scoffed at the notion, preferring to instead take pride in their tangible victories and the hope their story inspired. My column was somewhere east of Reims, trundling through a sloping farmland, when the first shell hit. I watched through my gunner's viewport as the tank in front of ours vanished in a cloud of twisting metal and acrid smoke. Somewhere, someone shouted that we were to break formation to receive the mortar fire. It would be the last thing I'd hear for a long time. My driver, Tom Banks, found a deep gear on our engine and began the tracks turning. That small movement saved my life as the mortar round struck us. There was a moment of comfort in the dented womb of my padded turret. All sound had left my head. The air felt hot and thin. The darkness was interrupted by flashes of warm light that deepened the shadows of the stitched wall padding which had prevented the buckled metal from gouging my skull. As it was, I could feel a wet pulling sensation under my cap. In one of the flickers of light, I saw that I was suspended by my harness and all was upside down. The light grew brighter, and with it the air grew hotter. As my sense returned, I realised that I might not be alive for much longer. The other tank lads often said it was better to put a round in your brain than burn. I could see the fire on the other side of the upturned interior, and knew that meant that Jim Baker, the other gunner, was already dead. I hadn't heard the shot, but I hoped he'd gone quickly. Tom's driver's seat was empty, and I saw him crawling towards me over what had been the roof of the pit. His mouth was open, and I could see his throat vibrating, but I couldn't hear any of the words. When Tom reached me, we struggled with my harness until he brought out a knife and slit the reinforced fabric straps. I half fell onto him, and together we crawled back towards the centre of, of our upturned tank. The fire which had engulfed Jim was robbing us of our air, so we breached the escape hatch. The fresh air brought new life to that blaze, and Tom shoved me up out first before letting me help him out quickly. Even so, the flames caught his fatigues, and we had to pat the fire from his calves. Singed, deaf and shocked, we slid from the underbelly of our tank into the crater we'd been flipped into. The earth had pitted under the impact of a mortar round, and we had to scramble up a steep bank to peer up over the lip of dirt to see what was happening. All around me, a battle raged silently. The air was dense with gunfire, ranging from small arms bullets to tank cannon rounds, once the mortars had softened our lines, a panzer attack group had crested the hill ahead and brought more death. What was left of our tank battalion was engaged with the far heavier Nazi tanks. As I watched, the panzers put blistering holes in our armour seemingly at will, whilst our slim bore cannons sent their shots ricocheting off the heavy German steel. Some of our boys had held their nerve and were trying to get around the back of the panzers to pummel the weaker rear and side armour of the beasts, but it was a losing battle. It was then that I saw it. The profile of yet another panzer tank loomed from the smoke near us, and its heavy tracks came within inches of our hiding place. A dozen flags were draped across its hull, 
on them picked out in bright but battle-stained colours were the allied flags. The jack sat next to the stars and stripes, and around them were pinned the undeniable friendly flags of the other allied nations. Swaddled as it was in our pageantry, I felt myself shout with relief at the arrival of what could only be the TTs. Its captured 88mm gun belched noiselessly as it passed me by, and I followed the round with my eyes as it slammed through a Nazi panzer in the midst of the swirling tank fray. The German tank combusted internally, and hellfire poured from its openings as it ground to a halt. As the TTs rolled past, causing the ground to shake, Tom yanked my arm to sit me back down inside the crater. He pointed wildly to the fuel cans which hung from the rear of our crippled and flipped tank. The internal fire was now blazing from the escape hatch we had used, and smoke was pouring through all the minor gaps in our tank's construction. The two of us slid back down the bank and began unstrapping them. The heavy cans sloshed as we did the work, and I could smell the fuel within. One by one, we got them to the top of the bank before the whole thing could explode and drive us from our hiding place. Looking back out over the fuel cans, I saw the TT's stolen Tiger tank was finishing off the Nazi ambush. The remaining Panzers were in full retreat, reversing in order to keep their thickest armour towards our AT rounds. The Allied tanks were giving them no room to breathe, like sheepdogs harassing a reluctant flock. Around us, the remnants of our crews who had lost their tanks were picking themselves up. Though I could not hear it, I remembered what the aftermath of other battles had sounded like, and I was glad that the screams of the wounded couldn't reach me. To my surprise, once the bloody business was done, the TTs and their tiger rolled to a stop in front of our crater. Around us, those that could cheered it with raised arms. I could see the rumbling twitches of its twin exhaust calm and knew the engine had stopped. Tom and I waited, but no one popped the hatch to greet us. I mantled the tracks and opened the hatch. Inside, the tank was empty. I clambered down into it and looked around. The belly of the stolen tiger smelled of sweat and all of the crew seats were vacant. In wonder, I touched the gears and levers used to pilot the tank, trying to comprehend what the hell was going on. I saw that the fuel gauge was registering empty and nodded to myself. That at least explained why it had stopped, if not how it was moving in the first place. I turned, looking around for signs that this wasn't crewed by ghosts, and my boot caught something on the floor. The edge of the underbelly escape hatch was wedged open slightly. I bent down and pulled it up. Below, huddled in the darkness beneath the tiger, was a tank crew. Their uniforms were ragged, but unmistakably German. One of them pressed his finger to his lips for my silence. His eyes were friendly, and I sensed he was fully aware of the hope they inspired, and how the knowledge of who they are would damage that. I nodded to him and thanked him. I left the TTs to get back in their seats and climbed from their renegade tiger. As I left, I closed the main hatch and shouted that they needed fuel. Tom and I were helped by the other survivors, and when the big tank was filled up, I tapped on the hull to let the TTs know. Their Tiger engine started up as they began to pull away, and the boys around me had their mouths open in song. My hearing came back a few hours later, and the others asked me what the TTs were like. I said they were brave men, the bravest. I hope they made it home. I bloody loved that. I loved it too. I'm glad. <laughs> I thought it was going to be a ghost story and then that spin at the end, that reveal was fantastic Thank you um, Yeah, I appreciate that I was initially, I, guess, I think I think I wrote down what if there's nobody inside and I was like, oh that's too, <laughs> that's too <Yeah. laughs> I can't do that um, and then it was sort of playing with the reasons why. So as I said, like, um, so we've actually already had, actually, I think you even called them a panzer tank in your one, Nico. I did. So, so we've had that. And then you also mentioned the, the running out of fuel thing, um, Nina, as well. So it's got a bit of both of those things going on. Well, I, I liked it. I liked the pair. I actually was thinking the two stories make a natural pair because that's the tank, you know, how it um played its part in the war and then in nico's story that's where we end up with it yeah. i really like that <laughs> yeah interesting to pair it yeah yeah <laughs> it was obviously done over a short space of time because of the nature of you know the flash fiction that we write mm. but this guy's journey from oh you know it's all it's all hokum isn't it tanks a, a tank is a tank 
I'm glad they've got it because we need to make holes in things to truly believing in it because of what he sees is that's just lovely. It's it's what war stories are meant to be like. All the best ones go that way, don't they? And it's mm. yeah, I just it evoked something in me. The same thing that uh, Saving Private Ryan does, and I do not say that lightly. That sense of especially you know when his hearing was gone and everything was exploding around them that sense of desperate longing for a way out felt very real and for it to then you know this this symbol of hope to then you know not only restore his hope but his hope in humanity when he gets into it just yeah really strong stuff it's it's it really reminds me of one of um William Sanson's little war stories, you know, he actually wrote them in the aftermath of um, and during the Second World War and, you know, like firemen hosing down bomb damage that, you know, ruined, blitzed London, that kind of thing. It's got that sort of vibe of this is a little episode from a larger conflict, uh, but somehow emblematic of that conflict. And it works really well in that way. Oh, that's... Uh, th- those those are both very very kind compliments and and I'm glad you liked it. And I'm glad you got something from it. It was it obviously this sometimes it, so on the in the past you know I've I've written um, some stories that are rooted in sort of historical um, uh, moments, um, but obviously this is this is completely made up. This um, this whole thing about these uh, this renegade uh, German tank crew, um, but the uh, I was actually told. Um, not a similar story, but you can sort of see, you'll see where I got this from after I finished this little bit. But um, as, a, as a kid, I, um, one of my grandfather's best friends was a um, Romanian man who'd um, actually fought for the Nazis as a, I think he was 15 or something when he was conscripted. Um, and he was, he was put into a tank crew and sent to Russia. Um, we know how, that, how well that went. Um, so he's got he has this very deeply scary story that he told me when I was a kid about what it was like when his tank got knocked out by Russian mortar fire in the middle of a Siberian frozen forest, and he was essentially had to run through the forest whilst deaf, whilst he was being hunted by Russians with dogs, in order to surrender to the Allies, um, and he um, he ultimately um, was put in a, a POW camp in in the uk and he <clears throat> met an english woman and married her and had kids and had a very happy life in the uk and he ended up um being one of the men that uh, was putting the um you know the wreaths down for the memorial day mm-hmm. they um the local uh, the, the local yeah. veterans and stuff wanted him to join and help them do that every year um because he was very much like a sort of victim of circumstance when he's just a child drafted for war basically so I, i've had this sort of story in the back of my head about what it's like to be in a tank that gets hit by a mortar round and then flipped since I was a kid. Um, so it was quite nice to get it out into this very, obviously this is a very different setup and story, but um, I think that That's might possibly where a bit that, uh, that verisimilitude is coming from. That's extraordinary. Yeah. yeah. With him yeah. being such a young man, it adds a lot of credence. You had a line in there that I wrote down, which was the dented womb of my padded turret. Mm. And him you know, being a young man is then born into the real horror of war. So that, yeah, well done you. Extra layers on that cheeky metaphor. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Uh, extraordinary. What a, what a story though, that, you know, the guy, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I love the way, I love the way both you guys immediately alighted on the same meaning of the word tank that's really fascinating in and of itself <laughs> we've been yeah. saying this for three seasons now haven't we that at some point we're both going to accidentally write exactly the same story yeah. <laughs> i think this is one of the closest we've got i know the stories are completely different yeah but, but that during both stories someone is inside a panzer tank that uh, yeah. is the closest i think we've come pretty it's pretty close <laughs> um although they're very different tonally and everything else it's it's very interesting there has been some times when i've approached a prompt and i've and i've thought oh that would be a good story and then i've thought oh no nick would have definitely thought thought of that though so i need to <laughs> yeah <laughs> but of course he then does his own 
marvelous thing. Uh, I normally do weird stuff. That's why yeah. <laughs> it's pretty safe. It's difficult to predict at the best of times. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, yeah, I'm glad that went down well. I uh, I wrestled with it a little bit because I thought it might be a little bit preachy about like the nature of war and and um, you know having having these sort of gems being uh, being the sort of good guys. Um, but uh, no, I'm glad I'm glad that went down well. I mean, we'll we'll have a preachy episode. War's bad. So is children starving to death, and Dominic Cummings is a bastard man. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Dominic Cummings is a bastard man. Why <laughs> <laughs> oh, Boris hate Dominic? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Tiny Bookcase. Remember to subscribe, otherwise you're going to miss out on the future fun. Also, tell a friend if you like this episode. Link them to it. We'd be tremendously grateful. You can follow us on Twitter at Bookcase Tiny, Facebook at the tiny bookcase and instagram at bookcase tiny for updates speaking of supporting the podcast well magic can only take one so far the tiny bookcase is supported by the generosity of its patrons those kind souls have really kept my belly full the last year let's cast a spell for them shall we for uh, Magnificent Beardery, let's cast the Chinicus Folliculale spell on Gary Laird. For Rich Ginger Tones on the scalp, let us cast the Orangi Hedondo spell for Scott Byrne. And for General Fabulousness, why not the Ula La Alge Mother spell on Matthew McLaren? How do you come up with that shit, man?